so much, Jeremy, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, and especially Sruk. It's been wonderful to see you all together. We've seen these two teams over the years. And for Sue and Tracy and Amy for the organization, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you. And um, I'd like to start with the comment that stem cells are being discussed everywhere now for regenerative medicine and so on, but there's a lot of confusion about what they really are. And I think I should explain to you that, that a, tr a stem cell in a classic sense is a cell that when it divides, one daughter cell remains stem. So this daughter can always keep doing that. And that's why we can make millions and millions of blood cells every day for 80 um, years, a few more years I have than Jeremy, but, uh, sorry Jeremy, um, but how can you do that for 80 years, just keep on producing billions of cells? because one of the daughter cells remains stem. The other one heads off and becomes a tissue or blood or something else, skin or cornea, and that cell will eventually die because it can't survive forever, but this guy can. Now, a lot of the literature that you see talking about stem cells actually are talking about these progenitor cells, and that is not a stem cell. So be wary of when people talk about stem cells. Um, something's happened to that slide. There are no pictures. I don't understand. But So what that slide should show is when a sperm and an egg meet, from that point on the cell divides and they're called totipotent stem cells. In other words, each one of those cells can make a full animal, human being or an animal. As it goes along after about three or four days, five days, those cells can no longer make a full animal, like identical twins or quadruplets. It can only make every, all the organs in the body. So if you take out the cells from the middle, they're called pluripotent. And these are embryonal stem cells. They're truly stem, but they're embryonal. And there are some ethical and theological problems with that. In some religions, the soul is created when the sperm meets the egg. And anything you do to destroy that is considered to be the loss of, a, of an individual. In other religions, it's not the case. So there's, there's some ethical issues, and we can talk about them later. But when we get down to a, an adult or a baby, it's called multipotent cells. These cells can no longer make a full organ. They can't make a full individual, but they can make different tissues. And every day, we're using our multipotent stem cells to survive the traumas of what we do to our bodies. The bl blood keeps making cells, the skin regenerates, the lining of the gut, uh, the eyes and so on, we're constantly making new stem cells. Even in the brain we've discovered there are stem cells which are, are replicating all the time, fortunately for us, Jeremy. Um, now, stem cells, like human beings, live in communities and they talk to each other the whole time and they're interacting. And a lot of the research is not done like that. They take a stem cell, let's say, out of the bone marrow, and they play with it in the lab, but they've forgotten that that cell has lost its, its family, it's lost its context. And they work in three dimensions, and in the, in the bone marrow, for instance, these stromal cells, which are like connective tissue cells, are necessary for the blood cells to be able to differentiate and do their job. So this is something also to remember. We're talking about a three-dimensional, they're called niches, and this is the new biology. And all research should really be around this kind of three-dimensional proper relationships. Here you see a stem cell giving a daughter cell, which then goes and makes all of the blood cells. Now, have you, you've heard already that scleroderma is not just one process continuing linearly. It's lots of different processes. There's fibrosis, um, of the lungs, there are um, loss of um, vessels. I don't know why a lot of these pictures are dropping out on this presentation. But at any one time, there are different processes in different organs. So finding a target to help you, the patients, is difficult for us. Do you focus on the blood vessels or the inflammation or on the, on the fibrosis and so on? I asked my good friend Chris Denton, who's no longer my good friend, uh, for a simple slide of the cells, and this is what Chris gave me. Um, and I guess what he's trying to tell me is that there is no simple slide, 
for the cells that are involved with this disease. And now I've completely lost the talk. I'm sorry, I don't know why. Um, there's a technical issue here. I have it on a stick if someone can do that, but... Um, okay. Well, this picture here should show a group of kids fighting in a classroom. You know, they're all throwing food at each other and so on, teenagers. And the answer is, who started it? If you walk into that room, do you say, what did you do? Did you throw, who said, th you don't. You say, shut up, sit down, let's all start again. I don't care who started this, I just want all of you to go quiet and start again. Now this is, in a sense, the concept of a hematological autologous stem cell transplant, and I'll explain it to you. So, the concept is that you've already heard that we've used for many decades, we've used drugs which are immunosuppressive, which damp down the immune process, and we sort of think they work in many conditions. But the idea is that what if you wipe out everyone, not just the bad guys, but everyone, all of the hemos, he all the blood cells, all the good and the bad cells, and then start again by giving fresh stem cells and seeing if the whole thing can, in other words, like walking to that room of kids and saying, I don't care who started, everyone shut up and we start again. And that's exactly what the concept is. Now, if you do that, would that change, reset, or reboot, as some people say, the immune system? Or would it just simply happen all over again? Well, the answer is it doesn't. And I'll show you the data. But what an autologous transplant is, it's been used for decades in hematology. This is not new. We just adopted it from treatment of certain kinds of cancers. So the, the stem cells live in the bone marrow. They dri they're driven out of the bone marrow by giving the patient certain substances, including cyclophosphamide and growth factors. And then you can collect them through a, 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 a vene section, and you can play with them. You can get rid of the cells you don't want, or you can keep the cells you want. You put them in the fridge, and then the patient comes back a few weeks later, and then you can give the really heavy treatment. This is the shut up, sit down, everybody part. This is where you say, everyone keep quiet, everyone's got to stop. And there are different ways of doing that with drugs or antibodies and so on, and I'll show you the data. And then when you've done that, you give back the patient's stem cells. They find their way to the bone marrow, which is a little biological miracle almost by itself. And when they get there, they do their job they start making blood again, including the immune cells. And we hope that those kids are now quiet and they're not fighting anymore. And the first patient was in Basel and there was a lady with pulmonary hypertension and we'd done everything we could. And we thought, well, we can't give cyclophosphamide too much because that would actually wipe out her full bone marrow and she wouldn't survive. And the hematologist said to us, well, we do that all the time, but we take their stem cells first. So this was like a meeting of two disciplines which had never talked together and it started the whole project. I can tell you that 20 years later this lady is doing well and her pulmonary hypertension, this high blood pressure in the lungs which you heard about, um, actually has stabilized. It came down and stabilized, not fully normal but enough for a normal life. And she doesn't take any other drugs. So this led to an international project. I won't go into it. This is an out of date slide but it's pretty much the same. And I think we can say that in the world there are around 2,000 humans have received an autologous, that means from themselves, uh, stem cell transplant of the blood cells for an autoimmune disease. And you can see this is the European data. Most of them have been for multiple sclerosis, but a lot of them have been for scleroderma, systemic sclerosis here. And in America there are about 500, so overall it's about 2,000. So what happened? Well, this is the kind of patient, and Professor Denton said it very well this morning, this, this is not for every person. This is for rapidly progressing and poor prognosis, people who you just know are not going to do well with conventional therapy and have already tried some conventional therapy. This is a patient of my colleague and friend, Professor Van La from Utrecht, who was in Newcastle. And this is a beautiful girl who then, within a few years, the lungs are fibrotic, these people have a very poor prognosis and we had nothing really to offer them in that situation. So this started um, three big trials in scleroderma. One which is finished now, this is a European trial. This is the American trial which is finished. The data was 
was locked last week and we'll start to hear the data analysis very soon. I chair the safety committee of this one, um, so I know what's going on and we collaborate very closely. And a small study from Chicago um, showing basically that in the right situation, in many patients, but not all patients, you can seem to shut down this, this process. This is a particular example, and of course, case examples is not science, but it's an example, a representative example of a patient of mine who's of Indian origin, and you probably know that people of color, when they get scleroderma, they often have deep pigmentation and depigmentation, and it's, they don't like that. The contraction, thickened skin, you, you know the situation. She went through a transplant and her skin went back to normal. It didn't just improve, it went back to normal. And I'll show you some data which makes us think that this is something new. Also, not this patient, but other two patients which we've also published, this, this vascular changes in the nail folds, which you all know we measure with irregular vessels, over three months following the transplant, um, returned to normal in these two patients. And the colleagues in Seattle who have collaborated with us very closely published this data showing that with time over five years, a patient lost the collagen and fibrosis in the skin almost to normal after a transplant. Now, I, I remind you that stem cells are not the treatment. The stem cells is just rescuing this bone marrow, which we've, we've basically dropped a bomb on, and we have to bring it back. The treatment is the heavy immunosuppression that did that. It's the bomb, it's not the rescue. So it's a happy ending for this girl, and she met a very nice man, and they got married, and she's showing off her beautiful skin, which has actually returned to normal. Her ray nose is gone. The puckering around her mouth is gone. The anti-nuclear antibodies are gone. In other words, this patient is cured. But we're talking about 15 years, and maybe in five years it'll come back. We don't know. But this phenomenon has been seen on both sides of the Atlantic, by different groups, and we really do think that something new has happened. So when you think something's good, you have to prove it. And the only way to prove things in clinical medicine is to do a proper randomized study. And we did this with transplant versus one, one year of monthly pulse uh, intravenous cyclophosphamide. And what happened was that we knew that up front there would be toxicity. This is not a gentle treatment. It's dangerous. And in fact, 10% of the patients actually died during the treatment during this period. They knew that could happen. But what happened for the treatment group um, was that they stabilized after two years, and they have remained pretty stable, whereas the other group, no one suffered from the treatment, but with time they crossed over, and this group is continuing to fall off. And my colleague, Yap Van La, who's the first author on this paper, will be <laughs> presenting a follow-up of this data, I hope, very soon. So yes, it did do something, but it took this was exactly what happens in stem cell transplant for other conditions, like um, blood disorders. So we can summarize and say that this is a treatment for poor prognosis, early diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis. I don't think this should be offered to randomly to people. Um, a, an expert in the field of scleroderma should make this decision with the patient and their family and go through all this. Um, we know that there's an upfront toxicity, but I must say, that this is also 50% of that was due to the time when we give these drugs during the transplant. And when the, the, when the cells are all killed, they release a lot of cytokines and chemicals which cause fever and lung distress. And that was the reason for 50% of these. It was four out of eight patients. And there are new technologies being developed by certain companies which will reduce the toxicity of this um, so-called conditioning to maybe bring it down to a level which is very acceptable for a condition where people at that moment are not on, on, on a serious situation. We, funny enough, we noticed that smoking was also a risk factor, but we've known that for a long time. So I guess um, in summary we can say that in some patients it's possible to reset autoimmunity. I won't show you the data, but we have immunological data showing that when these people recover from the transplant and their blood returns and their antibodies and their immune system comes back, it comes back normally. It's not constantly suppressed. So when they remain well, it means that they've been reset. Now this is like identical twins. N identical twins have the same basic biology, but they don't always get the same disease. So yes, you can reset. 
Um, it lasts for, in some patients, well, at least up to 20 years and hopefully longer. There were relapses. About a third of patients did relapse and required treatment again. But for a scleroderma doctor like us, it was fascinating to see that when they relapsed, they responded to very simple treatment, like methotrexate, for instance. Would It seemed to make their sensitivity to treatment reset to a lower level and therefore easier to control. Um, there is a significant risk, and it will always be something more than zero. Um, and it may be possible to reduce this toxicity. And I mentioned new technologies of being able to get rid of all these immune cells without causing too much toxicity. And don't wait till it's too late. I receive, sadly, em uh, emails nearly every week from desperate cases saying, I've done everything, I'm on oxygen and so on, can you do one of your transplants? And, s and that's not the time, that's far too late. Um, so I want to thank these people, especially this is the, the hematologist who steered me through all this. Hematologists have been through this discipline for decades and they taught us how to, be, how to do it. Yarp and Dominic who are, and Chris Stanton, Carol Black who keep me inspired and so many others I can't mention. But I especially want to thank you, the patients, for trusting us during this period. Thank you so much.